Hello, everyone. On behalf of the United Nations Global Compact and Freshfield Brookhouse Derringer, welcome to today's webinar on the UK Modern Slavery Act. Thanks for joining us. My name is Shiva Chandra, and I'm a manager of human rights, legal, and integrity at the United Nations Global Compact. Many of us have read articles in recent months about forced labor in various supply chains, ranging from construction to apparel to fishing. Forced labor and slavery continue to be rampant around the globe. In fact, according to the International Labor Organization, there are 20 million people worldwide who are subject to forced labor, labor today. The UK Modern Slavery Act, as will be explained in this webinar, requires companies that have annual revenues of 36 million pounds and above and that carry on business in the UK to produce an annual public slavery and human trafficking statement explaining the steps they're taking to ensure that slavery and human trafficking is not taking place in any of their supply chains or in any part of their business, or a statement that the company is taking no such steps. Many companies in the UN Global Compact have operations in the UK or are based in the UK and thus may be subjected to this act. We think understanding this act is important for all participants as it, is, as it is likely that if you are not affected by this legislation now, your home country may enact similar legislation in the future. Now, before jumping into ma today's main presentation, let's go through today's agenda. So this webinar will last one hour. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the UN Global Compact, I will give a short introduction to our work and the importance of the topic to the Global Compact. I'll then turn it over to Paul Bowden, uh, Michelle Bramley, Paul Yates, and Michael Quayle from Freshfields, Brookhouse, and Derringer LLP for an overview of the UK Modern Slavery Act. We'll then have a short Q&A session moderated by Paul Bowden. During the session, we'll be opening it up to you in the audience to submit questions to the panelists before we wrap up. Um, there's also a slide at the end of the presentation with resources for those of you who are interested in learning more. And while we encourage um, everyone to submit questions throughout the webinar, we'll be addressing these, que the, these questions to the panelists during the Q&A session only. And to do so, please type in a question in the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel, marked by the letter A on the screen. Please also indicate to whom the question should be addressed. Also, if you're experiencing technical difficulties, please let us know by typing a question in the questions pane or by raising your virtual hand, marked by the letter B on the screen. And just to note that today's webinar will be recorded, and the recording and slide deck will be posted on the UN Global Compact website. So just a little bit about the Global Compact, for those of you who are not familiar with our work. We are the UN's Corporate Sustainability Initiative, mandated by the UN General Assembly to promote responsible business practices and UN values to the global business community and UN system. We define corporate sustainability as deriving a company's long-term value in financial, environmental, social, and ethical terms. We are the main UN initiative for engagement with the private sector and the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the world, with over 8,000 companies and 4,000 non-business signatories based in 160 countries. We work with UN member states, companies, civil society, trade unions, and other organizations. We also have 85 country networks composed of businesses and civil society. This slide illustrates some of our work. So we call on business to operate ethically and to respect 10 universal principles on human rights, labor, the environment, and anti-corruption by integrating these principles into corporate policies and practices, shown on the screen on the left. We also encourage companies to explore opportunities to support UN goals, recognizing, however, that support for UN goals is a voluntary complement and not substitute for the responsibility to respect universal principles. The first two principles of the UN Global Compact relate to human rights and call on businesses to respect and support the protection of internationally proclaimed human rights and make sure that they are not complicit in human rights abuse. The corporate responsibility to respect human rights found in the UN Global Compact's principles is the same corporate responsibility to respect human rights found in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which were endorsed by the UN Human Rights Council in 2011. 
As many of you know, the UN member states adopted a set of goals in September 2015 known as the Sustainable Development Goals, or Global Goals, shown on the screen on the right. Goal 8 calls for promotion of sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. And in particular, Target 8.7 calls, calls for immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor and modern slavery and human trafficking and secure the prohibition and elimination of the worst forms of child labor, including recruitment and use of child soldiers by 2025 and by, sorry, and by 2025 and child labor in all its forms. Our labor principles shown on this slide are derived from ILO conventions and address the concept of decent work and efforts to eliminate forced labor and child labor. As such, today's topic of modern slavery is relevant not only to our human rights principles, but also labor principles as well. So with that introduction, I'd now like to turn it over to our colleagues at Freshfield for today's presentation. So Paul Bowden is a partner in Freshfield's London office on the disputes team, co-head of the firm's low carbon energy group, leader of its business and human rights team, and the partner responsible for global corporate responsibility. We'll also be hearing from his colleague, um, Michelle Bramley, who is a global head of knowledge for Freshfield's dispute resolution practice. Paul Yates, also at the firm, is head of pro bono at Freshfield's office in London. He's also a member of the firm's Global Business and Human Rights Group with a particular focus on advising businesses on their approach to modern, I'm sorry, on their approach to the Modern Slavery Act. And finally, Michael Quayle is an associate in the Freshfield London office in the EU Dispute Resolution Group. We have quite the group of lawyers from um, Freshfield to speak to you about the Modern Slavery Act. Um, so with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Paul and his colleagues. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Shuba. Um, thanks to the UN Global Compact as well for organizing the event. Uh, and from us here at Freshfields in London, a very, very warm welcome to everyone who, who's online. Well, as Shuba says, we're, we're here today to talk about uh, the UK's Modern Slavery Act, uh, a statute of 2015. Uh, we're going to look at what it is. Um, we're going to examine what it means for global businesses, in particular those businesses that are based outside the United Kingdom. And we want to talk a little bit of, as well about what those businesses should be doing to comply. Uh, this is the team that's uh, here with me. Uh, it's a team that works on the Modern Slavery Act, of course, um, but it's also got expertise in some other areas, in particular anti-bribery and corruption. And I'm mentioning that because it's becoming clear uh, that there's going to be a bit of a read across from what's been going on in the anti-bribery and corruption compliance space to how one can best deal with compliance in relation to the Modern Slavery Act. So there we are, that's the group who's here with me. And if we could perhaps move, move on, Shuba, to the agenda, to talk about uh, what our uh, presentation, or at least my questions to the team and their answers to it, uh, are going to be. First thing, we're going to try and give a brief overview of what the Modern Slavery Act, and I'm going to call it the MSA throughout the, throughout the course of the next hour or so. Um, we're going to give a brief overview of what the MSA is all about. What exactly is meant by modern slavery and why this is something that businesses don't just have to be thinking about but actually planning to take action around. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to try and address who's required to produce what's called an MSA statement. We're going to discuss this in the context of multinational enterprises because it isn't just you incorporated companies that should be concerned about the MSA. There are plenty of overseas companies with a sufficient link to the UK that are going to need to comply. To that extent, it's probably not an exaggeration to say that the MSA is a relatively rare example of a long arm statute that's been passed in the UK. Thirdly, we're going to talk through some key practical questions things on which the Act itself doesn't provide a huge amount of guidance. Uh, what, what, what sort of practical issues? Well, questions like, what does a company actually need to do to address human trafficking and modern slavery in its business operations? And what kind of due diligence does it need to do around that? What are the sort of red flags it ought to be looking for? What should it do if it finds a modern slavery issue within its organization or, or its supply chain? And how does it go about mitigating the risk 
And those are risks that are now and in the future as the company and its relationship with its supply chain and its business partners changes and develops. And then finally, and this is probably the most important part of, of, of this session, we've set aside some time uh, during the course of the webinar for you who are online uh, to ask questions uh, of our panel. And Shubha explained a little earlier on uh, how technically one can do this. So Shubha, perhaps we could move on to the next slide and uh, an overview of the MSA. And to talk about this, um, I'm going to ask Michelle uh, to run through what the MSA at a high level actually means for global businesses. Thanks, Paul. And Shubha, can I just ask, oh great, we, we're now over on um, slide 11, which is what is the MSA. So I'll kick off by saying that the MSA draws together a whole host of existing legislation and introduces some new concepts as well. In effect, it acts as something of a consolidated statement of the current law on modern slavery here in the UK. And it deals with quite a wide array of slavery-related issues. Um, so that includes updating the criminal offences relating to human trafficking and also in relation to forced labour. And it also introduces new obligations on public authorities to gather data on modern slavery and then to pass that on to the UK Home Office. And also it establishes a new anti-slavery commissioner. Now, the part that's most relevant to global businesses is Section 54, and that came into force in October of last year. And what that does is to require certain companies to produce an annual report on the steps that they have taken during the financial year to ensure that slavery and human trafficking is not taking place in any of its supply chains or in any part of its own business or a statement that, is taking, that it is taking no such steps. So this is fundamentally a, really a reporting requirement. And the MSA specifically does not require companies to guarantee that they will eradicate modern slavery from their entire, entire supply chain, because let's face it, no company can ever guarantee to deliver on that. What we're talking about here is um, eradication basically as, as a direction of travel. Um, and what the MSA requires is simply that the company reports on the steps that it has taken on that journey in the preceding financial year. And at its core, this is about transparency rather than about outcomes. Businesses are encouraged by the MSA and by the accompanying Home Office guidance to report on how effective their approach has been, and even to adopt key performance indicators. But legal compliance with Section 54 is also going to be achieved by stating that no specific steps have been taken. But as we'll talk about during the course of this webinar today, there are obviously you know, many good reasons why a business might not want to take that kind of minimal compliance strategy for the MSA. Okay, thanks, Michelle. I'm, I'm going to ask you, Michael, Michael Quayle, this question. Has this Section 54 statement obligation come out of nowhere? I mean, what's, what's the background to all this? Well, actually, we, we see Section 54 of the MSA as, as just one of the more recent manifestations of a, of a broader global trend towards obligations on businesses to report on human rights issues that are linked to their operations. And um, the, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights which were introduced in 2011, and I'll talk about those, and I think we'll all refer to them as the UNGPs throughout the rest of this presentation, uh, were, that was really a catalyst for, for this sort of legislation. And as we'll discuss when we get on to talking about what a company should do to address the modern slavery issues in, in, their, in its operations, the UNGP is highly influential in how, as a matter of best practice, the modern slavery act should be implemented. The UNGPs are a set of voluntary guidelines aimed at states and businesses which create a framework for how the impact of businesses on human rights should be addressed. They restate the obligation on businesses to respect human rights, provide detailed guidance on the due diligence that should be conducted in order to assess an enterprise's impact on human rights, and they set out the steps that should be taken in order to mitigate and in order to remedy those impacts. The MSA is really the hard law implementation of these concepts just in relation to one area of human rights, i.e. the right to be free, free from slavery or servitude, which is set out in Article 4 of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The MSA is not the first piece of legislation globally to do this. 
It's broadly based on the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, which uh, came into force in 2012, I believe. It's also very unlikely to be the end of the story for human rights reporting, either in the UK or elsewhere. In 2014, legislation was introduced within the European Union that will require listed companies and companies of, of a certain size to report on human rights issues more broadly. A number of countries, including, for example, the UK, are currently consulting on how this will be implemented, and it's very highly likely that these reporting obligations will be shaped by the, U U the UN Guiding Principles. Uh, human rights. Okay, thanks, Michael. Let, let's come back to the UN Guiding Principles a bit later on and, and just focus for the moment on the Modern Slavery Act. Uh, Paul, Paul, Paul Yates, what exactly is modern slavery? I mean, under what kinds of circumstances could an organization find itself engaged in slavery or human trafficking? Yeah, well, the, thanks, Paul. The, the, the first thing I think it's important to note is that there are the several different words or phrases that crop up in this legislation and elsewhere and the way people talk about these issues, which are often used interchangeably to refer to broadly the same group of practices. So in particular, section 54 of the MSA talks about slavery and human trafficking, and then obviously there's the phrase modern slavery in the Act in general. Uh, the, the definitions of these phrases within the MSA are tied to the UK criminal offences, but these are slightly confusing, and I think for global businesses, or even a domestic business with a global supply chain, it's usually going to make more practical sense to look at the established international law standards. You know, thinking practically, can you really expect a tier 5 supplier in South America to be looking up UK criminal law statute alongside parallel but differing provisions from other parts of the world? So, I mean, there are, I think there are two obvious options if you're looking for a single global definition of modern slavery. The first is human trafficking. You can see up on the slide uh, the elements of that. This is defined as a matter of international law in the so-called Palermo Protocol. And this definition does actually already apply in the UK in civil law context. And contrary to popular belief, human trafficking in international law does not require movement. And the key concept instead is really about around exploitation. So as this slide shows, there are three elements to human trafficking. First, there needs to be an act. Um, this could be recruitment, transportation, and there's the movement but it doesn't need to be transportation, it could just be recruitment or harboring or receipt of a person. Secondly, that act needs to be done using one of the specified means, um, so that might be uh, threat or use of force, coercion, abduction, etc. One of the wider uh, means is the abuse of a position of vulnerability or position of power. And finally, the act needs to be done for the specified purpose, with, which is exploitation. And another mentioned exploitation is the key to understanding this definition. And that exploitation could include, for example, forced labor, sexual exploitation, debt bondage, and so on. Uh, now, the other alternative global definition to consider is forced labor. I think we've got another slide on that, Shuba. Um, and forced labor is defined in the ILO's 1930 Forced Labor Convention. Uh, as work or service which is exacted from any person under the menace of any penalty and for which the said person has not offered himself voluntarily. And the ILO explained this as applying to situations in which persons are coerced to work, that's the sort of key phrase, coerced to work through the use of violence or intimidation or by more subtle means such as accumulated debt, retention of identity papers or threats of denunciation to immigration authorities. So as you can see, this in practice covers very similar ground to the human trafficking concept, and it's probably the most appropriate global definition for most businesses to adopt. And uh, you know, one of the key advantages of adopting this forced labor definition uh, is that the ILO themselves have some really useful and free resources on their website. Uh, and an, an example of that is they've got a really helpful list of uh, what they call indicators, the present, uh, presence of one or more of which may point uh, to a case of forced labor. So they've got 11 of these indicators, which are set out in this slide. Uh, so that includes stuff like abuse of vulnerability, violence, intimidation, debt bondage, and so on. Uh, or the use of a recruitment fee, which is often used to pay to secure a job in the first place. Now, these indicators are really useful for training uh, to raise awareness of what modern slavery is in practice and how it might present itself. 
Right, so Paul, how much of a problem is modern slavery? I mean, wh where's it going on? Yeah, well, as Shuba mentioned in the introduction, the ILO estimate that there are nearly 21 million people in forced labor around the world. Uh, and that's actually considered a conservative estimate. So the 2014 Global Slavery Index put the total at 35.8 million. And just to put that figure in context, that's more than twice the number of human beings traded in the whole half millennium of the transatlantic slave trade. So this map, which breaks down the ILO estimate broadly by region, gives an idea of some of the slavery hotspots. Uh, you can see South Asia is a particularly problematic part of the world. But it's, it's really important to remember that modern slavery occurs everywhere and anywhere. It's not just developing countries or countries that have a particularly poor domestic human rights record. It happens in the US, in the UK, all over Europe. Uh, the UK's Home Office, for example, estimate that there are between 10 and 13,000 current victims of slavery in the UK. And it's really against this background that the Modern Slavery Act, the MSA, was introduced. Uh, it's not only governments that are starting to pay attention to this issue, of course. It's been a high priority for many human rights NGOs for years, and increasingly it's attracting serious media attention. Uh, so in terms of how it, modern slavery is relevant to global business, I mean, one thing that's been in the news a great deal recently is the situation of workers used in the preparation for major sporting events. Uh, you know, mainstream news outlets have reported on the poor working conditions, debt bondage, retention of passports, and a whole host of other modern slavery related issues in relation to those involved in the construction of stadiums and infrastructure. And it's not just construction, of course. You'll, you might remember the, um, there was a big expose in 2015 by the UK newspaper The Guardian on forced labor in the fishing boats off the coast of Thailand and in South Asia generally. Uh, and again, it's not just developing countries. Uh, there was another Guardian investigation in 2012 uh, that was looking into the extensive use of forced labor by a gang master in the UK that supplied workers in the collection of eggs for the so-called Happy Eggs brand, which were uh, you know, a major brand of eggs sold in the UK supermarkets. And, and when scandals like this make the press, obviously there are significant reputational impacts on businesses found to be involved, and there's even the possibility of international sanctions, something that it seems the European Commission are currently considering in relation to the Thai fishing industry. Yeah, I can, I can see there are pretty obvious commercial and reputational reasons why business you know, really should care about modern slavery issues. But, but aside from the overarching concern about operating as a responsible business, are there any other reasons why it's something that all businesses should be looking at? I mean, Michael, I've, I've got to ask the obvious lawyer's question here. Is there any litigation risk with all of this? Well, Paul, the, the short answer is, is yes, and, and that risk is, is only set to increase, particularly the introduction of legislation like the MSA. Um, and Shiba, I think we have a slide on this. Thank, thanks very much. Um, so, so increasingly, claimants in, in, in multi-claimant lawsuits are turning to the norms and standards of corporate behavior laid out in the, the UNGPs, going back to those again, as a basis for bringing claims. Tortious liability presents a material exposure where an organization has a high level of control over a relevant abusive practice, i.e. Where, where with modern slavery directly forming part of their business or the business of a tier one supplier. An example is uh, going back to the, uh, the, the the case that Paul mentioned a second ago, which is the recent claim brought in the UK against DJ Houghton's catching services for exploiting six Lithuanian men in conditions of forced labor to, to harvest the so-called happy eggs. Legal liability for modern slavery at the very bottom of the supply chain can also appear through consumer protection litigation. Several class actions in California have been launched in relation to supply chains for products involving chocolate, pet food, and prawns. One of those claims has been brought on the basis that the company concerned has misled consumers into buying products which are tainted with slavery, partly by issuing statements under the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, which the plaintiffs allege are not accurate. So if we could just have the next slide, um, I'll talk about a parallel development, which has been the increasing use of the OECD's National Contact Point Mechanism. This is a mechanism that allows individuals, companies, or NGOs to make a complaint to a designated entity. In the US, it's the US Department of State. Um, in relation to breaches of the OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises, these guidelines contain labor and human rights provisions, the latter of which consciously reflect the UN guiding principles, which could readily apply in a modern slavery context. 
Companies that fail to have adequate procedures in place risk formal censure from the NCP. And given the low admissibility criteria for such complaints, and the fact that some NCPs, such as the, the NCP in the UK, have shown themselves to be very highly engaged in these issues, is increasingly a popular mechanism for NGOs, in particular, to put human rights issues into sharp focus and flush out information about an enterprise's policies and procedures that could conceivably lead to rep reputational harm and, further, could provide fertile ground for potential litigants in establishing, establishing tortious liability. Okay, so there is a risk there. Thank, thanks for that, Michael. Shubha, I wondered if we could possibly move on to the next header slide. We're moving on to the second of our issues, uh, which is what might seem a simple question. Uh, it is a simple question, but it doesn't have an easy answer, which is who is required to produce uh, an MSA statement? So before we get into the second part, let's just take stock of what we've discussed so far. Uh, we talked about what modern slavery is, uh, why it matters to businesses, but coming back now to the MSA itself, uh, there are a number of legal issues the companies uh, have actually got to consider. And as I said, first and most important of all is who, at least as a matter of law, under the Act, has to produce an MSA statement. So, Paul, can, can you take that one, Paul Yates? Yeah, sure thing. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're quite right. There are really two questions here. You know, firstly, there's the technical legal compliance issue of which entities within a corporate group will be required to produce a statement. And it's really important, I think, to remember here that the Act itself, or Section 54 of the Act itself, applies at the level of individual legal entities. Have you got a slide on this, Paul? Uh, not at group level. I should do, yeah, there we go. The next one. Yeah, let's get them. Thanks, Shubert. Yeah. There, here we go. So, obviously, that's not to deny that there are uh, multiple commercial, reputational, and even simple organizational reasons why a company might want to issue a statement which encompasses more of the companies in its group than just those that are strictly required to produce a statement, or even publish a single statement for its whole group. But I think working out first what's legally required is a really helpful first step, not least to explain the requirement internally within your business. So we'll talk about some of those broader considerations in a moment, but uh, let's turn first to the specific legal test in Section 54. So the Act itself sets out a basic four-stage test, and an entity will be required to produce an MSA statement for each financial year that ends on or after the 31st of March this year, if it, first of all, is a commercial organization, secondly, supplies goods or services, Thirdly, has a total global turnover, including its subsidiaries, of £36 million pounds sterling or more. And finally, it carries on a business or parts of the business in the UK. Now, the first three of these requirements are pretty straightforward, so I'll deal with them quite quickly. Uh, starting with the first, the commercial organization, that's defined as any body corporate or partnership, wherever that organization is incorporated or formed. Um, so that's a, a totally global in its scope. Uh, and interesting, there's no requirement that the organization is profit-driven. So the uh, business could include a trade or profession, and the UK government has given guidance that the, that, that the Act extends to organizations pursuing charitable education and public functions. So it's very broad. Uh, the second requirement... Did I get that right? It includes charities? It can include charities, yeah. Okay. Uh, the second requirement, uh, which is around the supply of goods and services, again, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, and it's important to note here that the Act is not limited to any particular sector or just to manufacturers and retailers, as is the case with the Californian Transparency and Supply Chains Act. So, um, but pure holding companies in a corporate structure that do not themselves provide goods or services but merely act as a vehicle holding shares in operational companies, they're not required to produce an MSA statement because they fail this second requirement, even if they do meet other elements of the test. Uh, the third requirement, that the entity have a turnover of £36 million pounds or more for the relevant financial year, that applies, as I mentioned, to glo global turnover, not just UK turnover. And calculations must also include both the turnover of the organization in question and also the turnover of any subsidiary undertakings, including those operating wholly outside the UK. So up till now, it's a really extremely extraterritorial um, application. But the fourth requirement is the most complex, and it's this part of the MSA that has caused um, some confusion uh, because there is significant uncertainty about its meaning and scope. And this 
part of the test, which applies in section 54, subsection 12, requires that the entity carries on a business or part of a business in the UK. Now, the concept of carrying on a business or part of a business is not explained in the MSA itself. And the relevant guidance from the UK Home Office, which doesn't have force of law. You've got a slide on this. Uh, I should do, yep, can we have the next slide? Yep. One. Good, thanks. Uh, so, the Home Office guidance provides pretty limited further explanation. It just says that ultimately the courts will be the final arbiter as to whether an organization carries on a business in the UK or not, taking into account the particular facts in the individual case. Uh, the Home Office also say that they expect the question to be determined by the application of a common sense approach and uh, anticipate that applying this common sense approach will mean that organizations which do not have a demonstrable business present in the United Kingdom will not be caught. Uh, but the bottom line is that Section 5412 uh, has not yet been considered by the courts. Um, but the phrase carrying on a business is not unique to the MSA. So you can get an indication of how it will be interpreted by looking at the way the concept of carrying on a business is being construed in other contexts. So the phrase or variations of it has been used in various other bits of UK legislation, including notably the UK Bribery Act 2010. Uh, so what does or does not amount to carrying on a business in any particular case? It is a fact-sensitive fact question. Um, so there's no bright line legal test, but there is case law drawn from a variety of legal contexts that can help us form a view on whether a particular set of circumstances will or will not be considered carrying on a business in the UK. What, what I'm taking from what Paul just said is that multiple entities, both headquartered or operating in the UK and elsewhere within a single corporate group, might have to produce a statement. Uh, and I'm just wondering how that's intended to work. Does that mean that every single affiliate within a group of companies that has to produce its own MSA statement really does have to produce its own MSA statement, irrespective of what its sister companies and parent company may be doing? Michael, how, how is this going to operate? Well, this is, strictly speaking, Paul, you, you're completely correct. And uh, if we could pull up the, the next slide, I think it's slide 22, so thank you very much. Um, every entity that is required to produce a statement will need to uh, approve the statement in a board meeting, and it will be, need to be signed by a director for every single entity. However, it is possible for multiple entities to sign up to a single statement, or for the company to issue a, a single group-wide statement. So you would have multiple entities subscribing to, and their boards and a director of each one authorizing, that single statement. In fact, a group-wide statement might be the most appropriate course for many companies to take. The MSA is really all about transparency and customers, the media and NGOs, will be looking very carefully at the statements that organizations put out, not just in terms of how well they apply the letter of the law, but also in terms of how, of how well they embody the spirit of the transparency. It's important to remember that in terms of enforcement, if an entity fails to produce an MSA statement, the only way it can be compelled to do so by the Home Secretary applying for an injunction in the High Court. Realistically, that's very unlikely to happen. In reality, the MSA will be enforced, as it were, in the court of public opinion. NGOs and the media are likely to name and shame companies that dodge their responsibilities under the Act by failing to put out statements, by putting out statements that suggest they've done very little to tackle bond and slavery issues, or possibly statements that relate only to the bare legal minimum of the entities that need to produce a statement. So how much of these kind of reputational concerns matter for a given company will depend on, that, on the nature of that company. NGOs in the media are more likely to focus on consumer-facing household names, big brands or companies that have been criticized for human rights issues in the past. However, it's not also not impossible that attention will be paid to organizations that might perhaps themselves be less well-known, but have a significant investment or control over a more well-known company. I'm thinking primarily of investment firms, private equity houses, pension funds, and the like here. But even if none of that applies to your company, if you supply one of those more well-known names or any company that takes MSA compliance seriously, there's a good chance that those customers will start asking about what you're doing to combat bond slavery, not only in those companies that are carrying on a business in the UK, but as a whole group. And as we'll get on to shortly, that's what the MSA is really asking companies to do, to make inquiries of their suppliers to use leverage to compel them to address modern slavery issues. 
Some of those customers might start introducing a contractual requirement that the supplier must report on bond slavery issues, or might even take their business elsewhere if the supplier isn't doing enough. Therefore, tempting as it may be for some companies, at least in the short term, to approach the MSA from the position of minimal compliance, either in terms of which companies produce a statement or more broadly, that might not be a sensible approach, either now or in the future. Okay, thanks for that, Michael. Let's, um, should we, if we can, if we can move on to the next slide, please, um, and the third section of the, of the presentation, which is the content of the MSA statement. What do we really expect to see in it? Um, Michael, you mentioned at the beginning of, of, of the session, um, the Act itself requires companies to set up the steps they've taken in the preceding financial year to ensure that slavery isn't taking place in their own business or in their supply chains, and that's, that's clear enough. But, but, Michelle, perhaps I could come back to you on this. Uh, there's this all-important question. What are the steps that companies, big and small, actually ought to be taking? What should their statements be saying they are doing or they're going to do? And actually, where, they, where, where can they look to for guidance on that? Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, Shubha, if we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so, the legislation itself isn't prescriptive, and, in fact, actually, um, there's only very limited guidance available. But what you can see from this slide here is that there are a couple of areas that a business should be thinking about. So we're looking at due diligence or its operations. We're looking at anti establishing anti-slavery policies. And we're also looking at conducting training. But as you can see, you know, it's not hugely detailed. And the Home Office guidance that we've got on the MSA actually doesn't do a great deal more. So that explicitly uh, leaves the process to be adopted to the discretion of the organization. But what the guidance does do is refer directly to the human rights due diligence framework set out in the UNGP. So we're back to those. And what they do is to provide the current international standard for addressing human rights issues in the business context. And they actually set out fairly detailed instructions on what a business should be doing to assess and also to remedy its impact on human rights. And that's both in terms of its own business operations and those of its suppliers and those of its suppliers' suppliers, so beyond tier one and in fact all the way down the value chain. Now the processes that are set out in the UNGPs can very easily be applied to the modern slavery context. And, and as we've already said at the start of this webinar, you know, modern slavery is really just one part of the broader human rights issues that the UNGPs are intended to address. So from our perspective, we're advising our clients that the UNGPs are currently the best guide to the steps that a business should be taking in order to try and eradicate modern slavery from its operations and from its supply chain. And if we move on to the next slide, we're going to talk about some of the practical steps now that we can be taking towards compliance. So there are a range of resources that organizations can draw on in order to help them implement the UNGPs. And we've provided a link to, to a selection of some of those materials on a slide at the end of, end of the presentation for today. But I thought it might be helpful for us just to talk you through some of the key points that we see now. So if we move on to the next slide, Shubha, thank you. Um, so the UNGP process, I think, can be divided into three main areas. First, we've got conducting due diligence, and that involves identifying, assessing, and scoping the human rights impact that a business directly causes, contributes to, or is linked to. And then second, where human rights impacts have been identified, it's about taking steps to remedy them. So that might be adopting new policies or applying leverage to persuade suppliers to address human rights issues in their operations. And then the third limb of the UNGP compliance is about establishing policies and procedures to embed ongoing compliance and monitoring in order to prevent or to mitigate human rights impacts in the future. Now this process is obviously it's intended to address, address human rights issues other than just modern slavery. But as I said, for the purpose of today's session, um, I think it will focus on how it can be used in that particular context 
as we talk through each of these parts of the process in a little bit more detail. And just a little plug for us here at the moment at Freshfields, we have developed a toolkit actually which is designed to guide global businesses through the different elements of the MSA and the UNGP process. And we've created that based upon our practical experience actually from advising clients in a whole range of sectors here. But what I'm going to do is draw on some of the con concepts that we've developed um, as we talk about these things in a bit more detail. So if we move on to the next slide on human rights due diligence. So first of all, a company needs to conduct a risk assessment process and record the outcomes of that process. It needs to start by looking at its own operations and that of the companies in its supply chain to figure out where modern slavery issues linked to its business might actually be occurring. Now that initial stage, if you like, the initial process is twofold. So first, the company has to look at, at the very high level, at the policies and procedure and information that it already has on human rights, ethical trade, and other related issues um, in relation to its own operations. And here, what you know, we're effectively doing is conducting a gap analysis. And while a company might not specifically have looked at modern slavery in isolation before, um, within its CSR or its compliance functions, it might already have actually a whole host of information about the issues it faces and what it's already doing to combat them. It just may be that it's under a different label. Uh, and and what, what, what we often find is actually that our legal context, contacts, although they might be a little bit scooped, spooked by the term modern slavery, actually you know, they then find out that colleagues elsewhere in the business um, are already doing you know, far more in this context than they might have initially realized. Now, second is the desktop research that needs to be conducted in order to basically heat map where the greatest risks might lie from a modern slavery perspective. Now, that's going to involve an examination of the company's corporate structure, the location of its assets, the location and operations of the companies in its supply chain, and then the second part of that is to look at target, targeted internet searches of press articles, NGO reports, um, and other, you know, other publicly available information to figure out which aspects of the aspects of the operations represent a particular risk. Now we advise looking at three main risk areas. So first, we're looking at high risk sectors. So certain business activities by their nature carry a greater risk of modern slavery. And actually both Paul and Shuba have, have mentioned already um, that, that the sort of the example sectors there that uh, have historically got some poor track records in relation to modern slavery issues. And then the second point is that we're looking at um, particular high risk locations. And again, tying back to what Paul has said, but activities in certain geographical regions carry a greater risk of modern slavery. And violations are more likely where the company has operations or suppliers based in developing nations, and particularly those that are politically unstable or in which the incumbent regime has a poor human rights record. And then third, and I think perhaps the most critical here, is to look at the supply chain risks. So even where a company and its subsidiaries, they don't them themselves operate directly in a high risk sector or geography, a modern slavery risk can arise where its suppliers do, or I think where the supply chain is lengthy and not transparent. And then practically to help assess this kind of risk, you know, what a company might do is put together a list of the categories of the goods and services it buys and work out whether any of those categories represent a particular risk regardless of where the immediate supplier is based. So let's take an example. A company might buy clothes from France. Um, but who picks the cotton that goes into making those clothes? Does the company have any visibility on that? And might there may uh, and might there potentially be modern slavery issues, you know, much further down its chain of suppliers. So where potential modern slavery risks have been identified in the course of the first level heat mapping exercise, or where those risks can't be ruled out, what we recommend is that uh, you conduct a more systematic due diligence ex exercise focused on the types of risks that have emerged. Now that will involve 
reviewing the organization's existing compliance materials, which might be re relevant to modern slavery issues. And here I'm thinking about employment contracts, employee handbooks, supplier codes of conduct, procurement guidelines, whistleblowing policies, audits, for example, of working, working conditions within the business or of suppliers, and then identifying any potential red flags. And again, what we're really trying to do here is to try and assess what the company is already doing and where there might be gaps. And then what you also need to do is dig deeper into the potential red flags that the heat mapping exercise has uncovered. And that might involve more internet re research. But will, it will also involve making inquiries of, of people in parts of the business or of suppliers that are thought to represent a particular risk. And, and for that, for example, we might do a detailed questionnaire or we might actually conduct interviews. And the particular risks that are identified during the first or the second level assessment may then even actually require a third level assessment. Now, that will have to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis and it may be necessary to carry out further work on the ground. So we might actually need to interview relevant individuals in person or carry out on-site inspections and, and, and specialist consultants, for example, might get involved in that exercise. Uh, but it also might be helpful to conduct you know, NGOs working in the area um, and obtain their input on a particular issue. Now, where you've got particularly serious issues, they may obviously require a full-blown investigation. And if that's the case, um, you'll probably want to instruct external lawyers conduct, to conduct that so that you maximize privilege protection over the findings of the investigation. And that's particularly the case if there's a possibility of litigation being brought against, that, against the company. And the investigation will need to be handled carefully where it involves digging into the operations of suppliers, and particularly if they're not direct suppliers, because ideally, you know, we really need to get suppliers to buy into the exercise. And that might not always be easy, especially where, you know, there isn't the compliance, consults, compliance culture that we see, for example, in the US or perhaps in the UK. And if suppliers aren't willing to comply, then the company is going to have to be creative about how they try and bottom out a particular concern. And one way um, we found of addressing that up front is actually to include audit rights in contracts with suppliers that enable you to get the information that you need to satisfy your MSA requirements. Okay, <coughs> Michelle, thank, thanks for that. Um, let's say you've done all this due diligence at the various different levels you've described and you've uncovered some pretty strong evidence that there are some fairly unpleasant labor practices going on somewhere in the world that are linked to your operations. Now, I'm assuming the MSA doesn't tell you what to do about that, but the UN guiding principles do. Uh, and what do they say where you find this sort of evidence? Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah, so if we flip over to the slide, thank you, Shubha, on remediation. So where the due diligence uncovers a modern slavery issue, you've obviously got to take steps to address that. Um, it's perhaps slightly easier, although more troubling, um, when the issue lies within the company's own operations because it's much easier for the company to get its arms around that and you know, to basically impose new standards, conduct training, or if necessary, fire the people who've contributed to the serious harm. But it's clearly more difficult where the issue lies with a supplier, uh, let alone an indirect supplier, because that's, the company just doesn't have that same level of control. Now, the UN GPs are fairly sanguine about the realities of this situation. And Principle 19 notes that the appropriate response will vary according to the extent of the company's leverage in addressing the adverse impact. And the company's commentary adds that where the company needs, um, what the company needs to do will depend on the severity of the issue, how crucial the relationship is to the company, and whether, and this is, I think is particularly important, terminating the relationship would actually have an adverse impact on human rights. So if we move on to the next slide uh, on remediation, Shiva, um, what a company really should do is always going to depend on the particular factual circumstances. 
But what we've done here is to develop contractual provisions that can be inserted into supplier contracts or codes of conduct. Uh, and they require, for example, a supplier to apply particular standards in its operations or in that of its suppliers, conduct training or introduce reporting mechanisms, those sorts of things. But sometimes those types of measures just aren't enough. And if an issue is sufficiently serious or there's no workable remedy available, then the company might need to think about terminating its relationship and looking at engaging alternative suppliers. Now, in certain circumstances, that might not be feasible, or it might risk creating broader human rights issues. And there, actually, you know, the best practice might be to consider or to see if you can try and affect an industry-wide solution or get deeper involvement with multiple local stakeholders and NGOs in order to achieve some sort of systemic change. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. I think we're going to draw a presentation such as it is to a close, but we can't do that without asking Paul a question about websites. Uh, Communication is absolutely vital in embedding any change of culture and new approaches to policy within an organization. The MSA recognizes that, and it talks about how you use your website. There's some quite detailed rules in the Act about all of that. How do you tell us how it works? Yeah, that's right. Well, in a, in a nutshell, um, you know, the MSA statement, which is obviously going to set out um, all the steps you've taken, as well as your, your, you know, the, the company's position on modern slavery at the highest level, uh, it needs to be directly linked from somewhere on the company's homepage. So that's the homepage, not the website. Um, and uh, you know, the guidance does clarify that it's acceptable to have a kind of rollover link, so that you, you know, from that homepage, you you reveal a link by by hovering your mouse over something, but not it can't be a click away as well. So you're not, it, it's not acceptable to have it on a on a separate page that can be reached. Um, not not the immediate homepage, um, and I think the other thing to say about that about the, the the web page rules is that there is some complexity around when you've got multiple entities uh, and then a group website. And what the guidance makes clear is that basically you you use whatever is going to be the natural website that someone using that company services would would find on the internet. Great, thank you. It sounds to me as though the guidance you've described is an absolutely vital document you've got to read alongside the read alongside the Act, actually. But but that really brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, and uh, thank you to to our presenters for the moment. But we're not letting them go because we've had a fantastic range of questions coming in as as uh, we've all been talking amongst ourselves. Uh, and I want to spend certainly as much time as we have left to us to to tackle these questions. The first question I absolutely love. Uh, it's obviously come from the other side of the Atlantic towards us, and the question is, a new US law prohibits importation of goods produced with forced labor. Isn't that a more effective way than the MSA to drive a reduction in forced labor? Good question. Paul, what do you think? Uh, thanks, I think. Um, well, I guess what I would say is, um, it, it, there's not a choice really between which is better. I think they're both effective ways of addressing it. Um, I mean, I, I think the, 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 some of the measures that have been brought through in the U.S., including the federal procurement, the change to the federal procurement rules, will have quite far-reaching impact in, as they are slowed down through the supply chains. Um, but I also think, and this picks up um, this picks up another question that we were asked as well. I think I I do also believe that the the, the, the um, discipline of transparency that the MSA requires will also equally have a sort of complementary and far-reaching impact on the issue. Yeah, I mean, th th there's another good question here as well, actually, which I think you called, calls into question what the Act is, is uh, all about. Uh, and he says, uh, isn't it the case, I think it is the case, actually, that more, most forced labor takes place at the informal end of the spectrum rather than by bigger companies? Uh, so it's not the large companies as a result of the small and medium-sized enterprises who actually need to be addressed. Well, let's just take, that was actually half the question, but it's a great half question. Um, what about this point that it's really the SMEs that we should be looking at, and this isn't a big company statute, albeit I think it's fair to say we've been talking about, as, uh, talking about it today as though it is a statute for multinational enterprises. Michelle. 
I think the key point here, Paul, um, comes down to you know thinking about the value chain um, and the supply chain. So, you know, the reason for putting the big companies fairly and squarely in the spotlight here is, in fact, actually put, to put the obligation on them to make sure that those who they do business with actually operate um, in in an ethical way. That's how I would frame it. Yeah, it's a sort of top-down use, use, use of the concern by big enterprises who can afford to resource these things to maintain high standards and trust in their own yeah. businesses that is going to drive this up up the supply chain, as, as, as you say. That, I think, is, is fairly stated as the, as the philosophy behind it. Um, but um, there's another nice question mm. here, which challenges that proposition, I think, which is, do you think the reporting obligations on the NMSA will incentivize companies to develop less complex structures, or do you think businesses will still be able to keep their corporate structures fairly secretive? Gosh, it's a bit of a leading statement, be that as it may. <laughs> Keeping their corporate structures fairly secretive by using group-wide reporting without necessarily identifying all the affiliates or subsidiaries in the group. That's picked up very nicely on the point you were talking about um, uh, earlier on, Michael, about group reporting. Well, I, I think it's the important thing to remember is that even if a company does produce a group-wide statement, each individual entity within that group that is caught by this act will have to sign and approve that statement. So. Uh, the, 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 the statement might come from the might be posted on the on the, the sort of central company website, but it should have ideally listed out within the statement the, the names of all the all the organisations that it actually actually applies to. So I don't think this really the, the idea of a, a company producing a group wide statement really allows them to uh, abdicate their responsibilities to report on on the group or, or, or to as it were hide anything that's actually going on in their group structure. Right. Um, there's there's another there's another issue that I, I I'd quite like to come back to to be honest with you Paul and it's it's round it's around this question of the UN guiding principles the due diligence the reporting exercises that are in, that are involved in that and what you're required to do as a result of your implementation of the Modern Slavery Act um, to what extent are these two sets of issues and compliance matters for corporations linked? We've, we've intimated throughout that modern slavery is more or less just a manifestation of the UNGP. Yeah. Um, well, you know, obviously, and, we, and we've, we've covered this point in, in, in sort of um, at a high level, the kinds of issues that you'll need to examine under the, under the UNGPs are obviously much broader than just slavery. Right. Um, and the, and the, the definition of human rights under the UNGPs is very broad and, can, and, and includes all of, the, you know, all of the human rights that are... Uh, um, declared under the UDHR and so on. Um, in terms of process though, the UNGPs don't specifically require anything more than what we've discussed today and what we recommend is the best practice approach to managing modern slavery risk. Um, you know, in terms of the MSA itself, um, one of the key differences is that the MSA limits itself to supply chains, whereas the UNGPs are explicitly concerned with the entire value chain. However, you know, as we've discussed, the UK government's approach to the MSA has been explicitly recommending the UNGPs as the, as the best practice approach. Uh, so, the, you know, the, the whole process of due diligence, remediation, and embedding change applies equally in both contexts. Okay, that's great. Uh, the, the questions are coming in thick and fast at the moment in the, in the final 90 seconds of the game. Uh, there's, a, there's a nice one here, Michelle. I want you to take this one, which is, how is all of this, the MSA, going to apply to banks and financial institutions? I think that's an interesting one. So, you know, looking at this from the sort of funding perspective, if we take a read across really for, you know, the anti-bribery and corruption um, examples that we're seeing actually, you know, I think banks need to be taking this seriously. Um, they just need to be looking at it from, you know, the reputational standpoint here. And so I would expect them to be, you know, do, doing the due diligence actually in in in, in a very similar way uh, to to the companies looking at in you know, a sort of supply supply chain supply chain issue. So I would see banks actually having to take a similar type of, of approach in relation to their lending. Uh, absolutely. And to an earlier quickly to an earlier question, Paul, which was around supply chains and value chains. Are we just talking about 
modern slavery within the supply chain or in relation to wider relationships, including, for example, relationships with distributors down, downstream? Yeah, well, strictly in terms of the MSA, we are talking about suppliers, um, so, so any, anyone that supplies goods or services, um, but also the entire business, which is not defined, um, which, which could include business partners, I think. But um, when we're expanding out to the best, the best practice way of, of approaching this issue is to adopt the approach of the UNGP. That's where the approach really widens out to include all kind of business relationships including customers. Great. Sure, but I think we've just about hit time, actually, and the questions are still coming in, which I'm feeling very bad about, actually, that we, we haven't had a chance to, to get to. And many apologies to, to all those who's pretty sending in these terrific questions at the moment. We're, we're certainly going to make contact afterwards uh, to make sure these questions are addressed are addressed o o offline. Uh, of course, you know, we're always happy to you know car carry on beyond beyond the end of the game and into extra time, but, but to give you, give you the option of deciding what we should do, uh, I'm, for the moment anyway, going to sign off here from, from the Freshfields team, just simply to say that uh, together with yourself, uh, we put together a group of materials, uh, both on the Modern Slavery Act uh, and on the UN uh, Global uh, Compact appreciation of various different instruments relating to global business and human rights. There are some other useful sources uh, there as well. Um, just simply for me to say for the moment, many thanks to, to, to Paul, Michelle, uh, and to Michael uh, today for their insights. Thanks to the UL Global Compact for organizing the event, and not least of all, thanks to all of you who've joined on this link. And with that, Shubra, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Paul, and thanks so much for the wonderful presentation and for, for some of those uh, fantastic uh, answers as well. So um, if it's possible, I know a number of you, uh, we were getting still so many questions. So um, if the rest of the professionals team is able to stay on for maybe another five minutes, that would be terrific. Um, we can also, we'll, we'll um, just again, just to reiterate a point earlier made is that this is, record, this is being recorded and um, the link and the slide deck will be available on our website. Um, for everyone who is attending, we'll also be sending you directly a link to the website with this information, um, and we're also going to try our best to, in the, in the you know, in the case that we don't answer your, we're not able to answer your questions on this webinar. Freshfield has kindly um, agreed to help answer some of the questions after the webinar as well. So we'll be sending them um, some of the written questions that have come in, uh, and also um, seeking their expertise and answering some of those. But just with that, Michelle. Um, Paul and Michael, if you are still able to stay on for another five minutes or so, it would be great to tackle a bit more of those questions. Uh, absolutely, we would. We'd be delighted to actually, and there are some great ones coming up. The uh, um, and this indeed is is in no order of the priority of quality of questions that are coming. They're all terrific, but I mean, I, we need to take this one. It's a dead important one. I'm going to ask Paul. If a U.S. corporate has a subsidiary in the U.K., is the whole U.S. organization captured? Right, well, starting with what's kind of legally required by the MSA, um, the first step is to uh, to ignore the UK entity, assuming that is itself cause, which is implicit in the question. Look at the US entity itself, because as I say, the MSA applies at the level of the entity rather than the level of the group, and ask the key question, which is the fourth question, does the US entity itself carry on part of its business in the UK? So you know, you'd be asking questions like, did it have any staff based in the UK? Did it have a branch? Does it have an office? Um, th those kinds of things. And that's a fact-based question. And if the answer to that is no, it really doesn't have any business in the UK other than the fact that it owns a subsidiary which is based here. Okay, so, and a subsidiary which itself may be caught, correct? Yeah, then exactly. Even if the subsidiary is caught. Yeah then the answer, in terms of strict legal compliance, is only the UK subsidiary would have to report and produce a statement. Now, you know, then there's a, rep a commercial, reputational, operational question about whether it makes sense to you as a brand, as a business, to have one part of your group issuing a statement, setting out your approach to this issue, and another part that doesn't. But that moves beyond a kind of legal analysis into a commercial, a commercial question that will depend really on the nature of the business, I suspect. Yeah. Um, there's a related question here, which I'm going to put to Michael because it touches on one of the points you raised. For a company with headquarters outside the UK, 
is it okay to have a UK affiliate issue the statement without more? I think that goes back to a point that Paul just made about this being an entity by entity question. So if it has a if the UK entity is caught, then it should produce its own statement. If the if the company has if there is another entity which is based outside the UK, so in the US or wherever, um, if that if that entity is actually carrying on a business in the UK, then it will have to produce its own statement. So it can't just leave it up to the UK subsidiary to to uh, to do the whole thing. The US entity will also have to sign up to that, to whatever statement is produced by that group. Yeah, great. Let, let's just let's just stay with with statements and issuing statements because that's obviously you know the key priority of the day. Nice question here. Going forward, does a company have to take an additional step every year? Is it possible to repeat the statement from previous years if it has an established process to manage human rights risks? Michelle. So I think just on that one, I think it comes back to what we were saying earlier in the presentation, which is this is a, this is a journey. It's a compliance journey, effectively. And uh, what we would see actually is that the statement wouldn't be repeated um, year on year because actually what what would happen is the statement needs to you know establish the process yes potentially in year one but then in year two what it needs to do is identify the issues that have arisen as part of going through that process and then um, articulate in the statement what steps it has been taking to deal with those issues that have arisen. Right. Um, okay, what about this one? Um, it is related. If a company has published a human rights statement that's in line with the UNGP, can this be used as the basis for the MSA statement uh, and, and with uh, with the permission of the questioner, I'm going to, going to sort of elaborate on that and say, can this actually be used as the MSA statement? In other words, can you have a, a UNGP uh, uh, statement that basically wraps up, effectively on an annual basis, the MSA statement obligation? Michael. Well, uh, if, if a company produces uh, a UNGP policy statement that is completely comprehensive and does include uh, reference to modern slavery issues and fully tackles all of those issues, then there's no reason why that can't be used as your modern slavery statement as well. I think as long as reviewed every year. As long as, as long as reviewed every year. I think practically you would want to make the point in that statement that you do that that, that it is to be taken um, as the MSA statement for the purposes of the Modern Slavery Act. But in terms of functionally what you're doing, the, the processes are not, not necessarily distinct. The MSA is really just the modern slavery element of the entire UNGP process. So if you're doing the whole UNGP process and you're, and you're producing a statement of what you've done every year, then modern slavery issues should be wrapped up within that, and they can be. Yeah. Um, there's an, Paul, have you got a point on that? Well, I, yeah, I agree with that. I think that the, you know, um, the purpose of this provision is around transparency for customers and the, the, you know, the purpose of it is to make it so that customers can easily find your, your policy on modern trafficking from your, from your home page. And so I think if you are, if you are kind of your, your um, UNGP uh, statement or report contains your entire approach to modern slavery, I think it would be best practice to pull out the bit of that that, you know, literally copy and paste the bit of that that's specific to modern slavery and link that part specifically from your home page. Um, and, you know, one of the things we've seen with the first statements that have been produced and the way they've been received by NGOs and by um, others who've looked at them is that um, commentators have been especially keen to pick up on any kind of perceived failure to comply with one of the kind of actual strict, of which there are very few, one of the actual strict requirements of the Act. So I think um, I think we would be recommending people really explicitly pull out just the modern slavery bit if they are taking that approach of uh, using a wider statement. Right. Again, staying with statements, uh, there's some really key timing issues around this. Uh, and Paul, I think you're going to have to deal with this one. <laughs> uh, takes up most of your time at the moment. Are there deadlines for publishing an MSA statement? And if there are, what are they? This is pretty important to most people, and we've got a couple of questions up here asking that. Yeah. Well, the it obviously the, the the section 54 applies to financial years, 
and uh, it, you know, the Act starts to apply this provision to find out any financial years that finish after the 31st of March this year. Uh, there isn't a strict deadline in the Act itself in terms of when a statement um, in relation to a particular financial year has to, has to be produced, published. Um, the guidance recommends that that is within six months, and I think that's the figure that everyone's latched onto as the kind of deadline. But I would, uh, you know, sound a note of caution about that because it sounds like, you know, you have a, say you have a financial year ending in December, you think, okay, well I'll add six months onto that so I've got, you know, ages till next summer. Um, actually, in a way, you need to really keep in mind that there's a, there's a key deadline which is the end of your first financial year itself that is caught by the Act because that is your deadline for taking any of the steps that you then want to put into your statement. Once your financial year has finished, um, you know, cobbling together the, the steps that you've taken and publishing them in a, in, a, in a statement is going to be relatively easy to do. It's too late then, though, to start making, making, taking steps that you can then report on for that year. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to take this rubric as okay as the last question, although there are others, uh, and apologies for not being able to deal with all of them on, on, on this call to use time. We will, of course, as I said, come, come back on them. Um, We've talked a lot about companies and what companies ought to be doing. We've talked a great deal about reporting and statements and, and due diligence. What we've, what we've not talked about much are the survivors and victims of modern slavery and, and human trafficking. I think it's, it's actually right that we, we deal with a question that recognizes them. And the good question we have is, if a company um, has published a statement, or whether or not it's published a statement, if you're the victim of trafficking or bonded labor, how do you, can you, access grievance mechanisms? Michael. I think one of the, the obligations that, 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 that companies are under, under the, the, the Modern Slavery Act and, and really under the UNGPs is, is to proactively go out and look for these people. And that it doesn't just involve looking at this from a very reactive or sort of risk-based focus. Companies have to go out there on the ground, do the due diligence, speak to the NGOs, engage with the stakeholders, that being a buzzword that's used a lot throughout the organic principles, and really try and find these people because quite often, as, as, as Paul has indicated, they don't, they don't really have uh, an obvious voice and there's no, there isn't, it isn't necessarily going to be easy for them to access whistleblower hotlines or the kind of things that might be available to uh, individuals in more mainstream parts of the business. So, the obligation is on companies to go out there and, and find these people and find ways to help them. And, um, and and there are lots of organizations out there that can help help you with that. So, you know, there are a lot of NGOs working sort of internationally and both in, in, in countries on the ground that you can engage with and they can help you, lead you to these people who then you can you, you can help to sort of address some of those issues actually where they're happening. And we, and in, we have, at least here in the UK, the, the commissioner, and um, I think perhaps the final word for you, Paul, about uh, early intervention advice and the organizations, at least in the UK, with, with sister organizations throughout Europe at least, who can actually and do work actively in this area in directing survivors and victims uh, to those individuals such as the commissioner who at least generally oversee redress and grievances. Yeah, and I mean, I think the position in the UK is, is, is obviously going to be the same around the world as, as Michael's, as Michael's indicated, uh, indicated. But yeah, we have, you know, we have in all of the countries within the Council of Europe, there is some form of what's called a national referral mechanism, which is a system set up under the Council of Europe Trafficking Convention to specifically to identify and then protect victims of trafficking. So here, here in the UK, that's run by a mixture of the Home Office and the UK Human Trafficking Centre, and the NGOs, the frontline NGOs who work directly with victims, um, uh, can can refer people into that system, and they then get identified as a victim, and so on. Um, and that you know, those organisations are are I think would be you know great for businesses to do more in dialogue with them. Um, and I also think that remediate, we haven't really touched on remediation as part of the business's own policy, but I do think you know, that is one of the pillars of the UNGP, perhaps the one that's talked about the least, uh, is remediation in terms of providing a grievance mechanism for victims. And that perhaps, uh, if we could persuade Schubert and UN Global Compact might be our next webinar. <laughs>
<laughs> at, at which point, thank, thank, thanks again, and back to you, Shuba, thanks to the UN Global Compact, and to everybody who very kindly has stayed with us online. Shuba. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Um, and yeah, special thanks to Freshfield for really that great presentation and um, for answering all those really fascinating and really important questions, I think. Um, so just with that, we want to make sure that uh, we do provide you with some resources um, that are really great on this topic. Some of them have already been referenced by our colleagues at Freshfield. Um, I'd like to, to ask you to bring your attention to the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. They have compiled um, a list of slavery and human trafficking statements under the UK Modern Slavery Act. So do take a look at their, um, some of the, the um, statements that have been made available there. Um, there's also a number of initiatives that have been developed um, to, look, to look at both um, companies' performance on human rights. So the corporate human rights benchmark listed on the screen is one such initiative, which, will, which is investor-driven and will be looking at how um, Fortune 500 companies perform on human, human rights. So they already released the first 100 or so um, companies and their performance, so one place to definitely look at. Uh, know the Chain is another really great resource to, to take a look at. So just with that, um, I'd like to end the webinar. And thanks again to Freshfield and also to everyone that stayed online. We noticed that there's still a great number of you online and for your fantastic questions. Um, we'll try and get those that we didn't get to answer at the, on the webinar. Um, try and get some of those written responses from our colleagues at Freshfield and circulate that with the link. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to send me an email. My email address is on the screen right now. And thanks again to Freshfield for co-hosting this webinar with us and for their, again, fantastic presentation, very insightful, very informative. Um, and uh, we will be sharing the webinar link and slide deck with everyone that has um, registered for today's webinar. So thanks again. Um, we're out of time. and. Look forward to catching you on um, another webinar from Post-Society Global Compact. Take care, everyone. Thank you.